Who wrote the plan? You know, well, it was um, written, and, and by the way, it just became this plan, 323 pages long, which took us a year and a half of investigation to get out of the government. Because when we called them, they said, we don't have a plan for the oil fields of Iraq. We filed a Freedom of Information request saying, give us the plans for the oil fields of Iraq. And they, and they said, first of all, this is the Bush administration. There's neither freedom nor information. So, <laughs> no. They said, it doesn't exist. And I said, that's like invading California having no plan for the oranges. Come on. The U.S. press, Washington Post reported there is no plan for the oil fields of Iraq. BBC said, find the plan. We did. And we got it because the guys that wrote it told us all about it. In fact, the plan, which is now the, just adopted as the oil law of Iraq, was written actually in Iraq's capital, in Houston. <laughs> now, how do, how do we know that? Because we talked to the oil company executives who were working under the, the direction of, of a guy named James Baker and his institute. Now, if you don't know Baker's, he was the consigliere for the, for the Bush family and Bush v. Gore. He represents Exxon Corporation, and he also represents the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. They wrote these plans, and what was the plans about? It was, it says here, the purpose of this plan is to enhance the Iraq government's relationship with OPEC. <laughs> now, wait a minute, that's an oil cartel. It's illegal to enhance any relationship with an oil cartel, but we'll ignore that, James. Let's look at something else. How do you enhance a relationship with an oil cartel? I mean, you enhance your relationship with your wife by sending your flowers. You enhance your relationship with your God, a place like this, through prayer. You enhance your relationship with an oil cartel by keeping the supply low. It's a cartel. See, there's two role, rules of um, oil economics that I want you to understand. Rule one is that the lower the supply, the higher the price. And the rule two is the lower the supply, the higher the price. Get it? <laughs> oh, by the way, I, should, I want to warn you that the oil company guys didn't say they wrote the plan. It has all these state, once we got the plan that doesn't exist, it has all these State Department seals on it, you know, with the eagle, you know. So what, what, is the, what do the oil guys have to do with it? Like one guy from the big Hess oil trader, Ed Morris, the most powerful oil lobbyist. Part of our madhouse was excerpted in Harper's Magazine. They called Lewis Lapham at Harper's and said, I mean, with a phalanx of lawyers, a big conference call. Well, it must have cost them like $12,000 a second. And they said, we're suing you. We said, did we misquote you? Said, misquote us? We didn't even talk to you. I said, okay, well then we'll retract the article. Just tell us what part of this audio tape is not you. See, you can't do that, <laughs> ABC television, right? Mission accomplished, right? Lower the supply, the higher the price. So it's all about, see, a lot of people in this room I know think that George went in there to get the oil. Well, Exxon does not send in its exploration company, the 101st Airborne, to find oil and bring it back so that Bobby can fill up his yellow Hummer. Cheaply, no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Prius. <laughs> no. Um, they send in the 101st to go in and find the oil and turn off the spigots, the lower the price, the supply, the higher the price. When Bill Clinton, so you think that the war is lost, uh uh. Oil companies last year earned $120 billion more profits than earned by any set of corporations since the pharaohs, more profits than all the profits in one year than all the profits of the auto industry since the Model T. When Bill Clinton was president, the price of oil was $20 a barrel. Under George Bush, since the war Tom Tom started, the price has never gone below $50 a barrel. $20 a barrel, $50 a barrel. Mission accomplished. Don't kid yourself. Now, there's other fronts. Baghdad on the Mississippi. But there's a, at least there's good news in the war on terror. Come on, admit it. You know, as you know, after five years of intensive hunting, after five years of intensive hunting, the uh, Department of Homeland Security nabbed Greg Palast. <laughs> now, I know some of the rumor, the rumor going around, it was on Washington Journal, that I was arrested, that I was grabbed, actually. I was not, Matt and I were not arrested. 
they couldn't find us. I'm on television. <laughs> These are the guys looking for Osama, right? And think about it. I was really worried that I wasn't going to be able to get on an airplane to come home. That I was even more worried when I got on the airplane. <laughs> anyway, the, 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 the charge, you saw the film there. It was about this film, which was done for BBC, Link TV, Democracy Now. Amy got me in trouble. She sent me down. We were filming all those people. By the way, I have to correct one of my numbers. I just found out from the government it's not 73,000 people. It's 89,000 families. Find out what happened. By the way, all that devastation you saw, that was filmed a year after the flood. A year after the flood. Okay, so you got the wrong impression. That wasn't after the flood. It was a year after. That's what it looks like right now. So I was trying to film this. And so I was filming the people in the aluminum Guantanamo up under the Exxon plant. You saw those lights, okay? And they filed a charge of filming critical infrastructure. Now see, this is one of the reasons why I report, Carl Rove is right, I am a British reporter, why I report for British television, because investigative reporting is illegal under Patriot Act 3 here. So I do it there. I, and I used to be a joke, now it's true. They said, you are filming critical infrastructure. I said. What's critical infrastructure? They said, any major polluting facility owned by a Bush donor. No, that. <laughs> but that, basically, I did convince them, though, that finally, and that's the reason I'm not wearing an, an orange suit in the Pacifica Air America wing of, of Guantanamo, right, is that I said, um, Osama stopped watching my BBC reports uh, because he gets, he, it's easier for him to pick out that target using Google Map. Okay, yeah, right. Now, why did I do that investigation? I'm not going to... I, I, was, I actually used to do... Evac I did some evacuation planning work here in New York on Long Island, the richest standard metropolitan statistical area in the United States. Remember, richest is the operative word. Six-volume evacuation plan in every police station, in every fire station, hospital, everyone has a copy of the plan and not one page in there involves people leaving town by floating face down, okay? You get out there. So when I saw the, 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 the whatever was going down in New Orleans as the hurricane was arriving, I called FEMA. I kid you, I recorded this as I do. Um, and I said, wow, I want to see that evacuation plan you guys are doing. Can, you know, is online, where can I get a copy of the evacuation plan? They said, we can't locate it. <laughs> I kid you not. And then a couple days later, they called back. They said, um, actually, it's, uh, 